So, John, uh, we, we asked me about who the guests were uh, today. I mentioned Rodney Rockwell. I said, oh, what's Rodney talking about? I said, well, every year Rodney around this time comes on and talks about man landing on the moon for the first time. And uh, each year he d develops another new nugget of information that you didn't know. And, uh, John, I think uh, you meant some kind of mention of, of that Not everyone believes that that actually happened. That, that Some believe it was a hoax. It was a hoax. And I said, yes. I, I said, uh, and I, too, am a flat earther. And my iPhone changed it to flat weather. Oh, that's uh, which it thinks it knows more than me, which it may at, at times as well. But uh, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting uh, thing because there are still a pocket of people who believe that man never did land on the moon. Rodney Walkwell, is it true or false? Did we actually walk on the moon? We not only walked on the moon uh, on July twentieth, nineteen sixty nine. We also walked on the moon five additional times after that. So, so yes, it's true. If this was a hoax, can you imagine how many people at NASA would have to have been uh, forced to remain quiet about it? Well, not only that, but uh, also the contractors that were involved. And there were tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that were involved in the space program back at the time. So to try to keep something like that a secret, eh, I think it'd be uh, pretty, pretty difficult. Looking at 55 years ago now, 55 years and uh, nine days since the uh, first uh, moon landing with... Uh, an iPhone uh, to my side. Uh, I am told that I have uh, umpteen times more computing power in this little phone than they had at NASA the day that they put that uh, ship down on the on the surface. Well, it's uh, yeah, it's what they had in on board the spacecraft. Yes, uh, the the memory on the uh, Apollo command module and the lunar module, uh, the, the memory was measured in uh, kilobytes, not megabytes, not gigabytes, terabytes but just kilobytes, thousands of bytes of data. But at the time, they thought that was the most advanced stuff that we'd ever seen. It, it was. Uh, it was state-of-the-art back in 1969, but uh, far from it today. Yeah. So uh, in, in regards to that uh, moon landing, and the f I think you said five times subsequently we walked on the moon, uh, nothing since. When was the last time, 72? was uh, December 1972. Apollo 17 uh, landed on the moon. They were there for about three days. Uh, three different moonwalks, and then uh, they blasted off from the moon, came back to the Earth, and we have not returned since. Any particular reason why? Uh, money. Um, we, I guess, decided as a nation that we'd been there, done that. It was time to explore uh, other parts of space. Uh, following the Apollo program was the Skylab program, where we um, took an old, uh, essentially an old moon rocket, a, a Saturn V, and hollowed out the third stage and made an orbiting laboratory out of that, and that was launched in uh, May of 1973. And it was occupied uh, on three separate occasions, each uh, crew consisting of three astronauts, uh, the longest of which stayed in orbit uh, a little over 80 days. And has any other country been to the moon? Uh, no, not with humans. Uh, there have been several countries since that have sent uh, unmanned robots and uh, unmanned landers to the moon. Um, a few have collected samples and brought them back to Earth, but uh, certainly not in the quantity that we did with humans. Uh, we brought back um, just under 900 pounds of material from the moon during the, uh, the six moon landings. And is anything else up there worth collecting? Uh, what they're looking at now is, um, is mining the moon. Um, there are apparently rare metals, rare materials that uh, are quite valuable. Um, some of which could be used to fuel a rocket launched from the moon to land on Mars. I, I would presume that that technology did not exist in 1972. Uh, certainly not, no. Yeah, that's phenomenal stuff, Bill. Yeah, picking up on your point a second ago, Rodney, about uh, only two, uh, two missions that had people walking on the moon. Part of that, I think, was there was a pushback from a lot of the scientists, one of which was James Van Allen, uh, who the Van Allen Belt, one of the leading uh, space explorers. And he became very critical of manned spacecraft, uh, manned missions. He felt you could get a lot more bang for your buck with unmanned by for a pure exploration property uh, uh, programs. We had the same thing in the oceans. For a while, everything was manned submersibles. Then they drifted away. Everything now is unmanned. So it, my, I guess my question is, the fact that we're seeing some more manned today, is that from an image standpoint or is that from an efficiency standpoint? I think it's more of an efficiency standpoint. Uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's certainly possible to send uh, robots to the moon and, and do a lot of the things that humans can. 
but uh, as far as the ability to uh, look, see, uh, recognize, and acquire things uh, at, at that particular moment in real time, I, I think uh, almost requires humans to be there. Also, I think <clears throat> you, you can't discount the need for the, what kind of unity a hero brings. You know, we have these manned, the, the ultimate explorers were those that went to the moon. And my, you know, I was 12 years old when, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. Um, it, and subsequently, to discover just how much danger they were in, I think they were five seconds away from crashing the lunar module. They were, they were out of gas. They were, yeah, they were, they were running very low of fuel. They, they, they landed with what they estimated to be less than 20 seconds of fuel before they uh, were going to crash. Right, which is the line that was never really explained. You got a, a lot of guys turning blue here. After yeah. They set down. Um, yeah. As soon as they they officially announced that they were on the moon, uh, capsule communicator Charlie Duke uh, indicated uh, uh, we've got a bunch of guys down here about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that you can probably gather the data, a lot of the data you need through these unmanned uh, space launches or unmanned undersea or whatever you're going to do. But you throw in the human factor, and I, I think it's important. If, if you want to have a program succeed and you want to have the stories to tell that then make more people interested in the science, I think the human involvement is really important. That's what I meant, John, by when I use the term image. Yeah. Uh, image as opposed to the efficiency of science. Oh, well, yeah, it's certainly, uh, certainly true. The, the very first uh, landing on the moon garnered a lot of attention around the world. There were uh, uh, hundreds of millions of people that tuned in for the uh, the moonwalk that uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin performed several hours after landing. Um, they spent uh, a little over two hours on the lunar surface, uh, collected just under 50 pounds of lunar material, set up three scientific experiments, talked to the president of the United States, Richard Nixon, at the time, uh, got back inside the lunar module, went to sleep, and blasted off the next day. The next moon landing occurred in November of 1969, and uh, hardly anybody paid much attention to it. By the time Apollo 13 was launched, there was virtually no coverage of uh, any of their uh, televised uh, uh, transmissions back to Earth. Uh, subsequently, uh, they had an explosion in space, and here you've got three astronauts that are uh, hanging on to their lives, uh, trying to, uh, you know, get through the, uh, the situation and make it safely back to Earth, which they did several days later. At that point, everybody got uh, really uh, focused on it. But once again, after that was finished, in January of 1971, Apollo 14 went to the moon. And again, it was sort of an afterthought with people. Yeah, because it, it had been done. It, it had been done many times, yeah. and uh, people were just getting bored with it. Which was the mission where they read Genesis from? That was Apollo eight, um, and they did not land on the moon. They, they just, they just, yeah, they, orbited. they, they did um, uh, ten orbits of the moon in uh, December of 1968, and they read from the book of Genesis uh, on Christmas Eve that year. So I remember watching that live too. I was so into the space program when I was a kid. I mean, just absolutely devoured well, I, everything. I, I think we were all were. Uh, we we say we remind ourselves where we were when somebody was assassinated. The same thing when Apollo landed on the moon, and, and the folks got out and one step for mankind, or whatever the state was, and uh, we all remember that. Know exactly where we were. Uh, yes, um, uh, I was uh, nine years old at the time, living in uh, Pennsylvania, and I remember like it was uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the, the difference in technology when we look at what happened in 1969 versus what, say, Elon Musk is doing now with his program. Well, I mean, you can't compare the two technologies. I mean, they're just they're light years uh, uh, different. Um, when we go to the moon again in another few years, we're going to be riding in a completely different spacecraft, uh, much better computer systems. Uh, everything is going to be um, state of the art for our, our current time, and, and, uh, and the, the equipment's going to be a lot more efficient than what it uh, ever has been. And there's actually going to be more people on the moon. Uh, I think the first lunar landing, they're supposed to have three astronauts walk on the moon as opposed to just two, and uh, that number is sure to grow. And going back to our earlier discussion, Rodney, what is the purpose 
for a future moon landing? Well, like I said, right now they're looking about uh, acquiring uh, certain elements that the moon has that we do not have in those quantities that they believe exist on the moon. And uh, right now NASA's focus is is to see what's there and see if they could use that in order to launch rockets more efficiently to Mars, uh, hopefully someday with people on them. So it, does the new technology do anything to negate the the, the crushing G forces on launch and all the, just the physical forces that astronauts enjoy? No, not not really. It's still, I mean, physics is still physics. Right. Uh, when when you launch into Earth orbit, uh, you, you've got to go essentially from zero miles per hour to a little over 17,000 miles per hour. And then to go to the moon, you've got to accelerate from 17,000 some odd miles an hour to almost 25,000 miles an hour. So you're still going to have the... Um, the G-forces are, are still going to exist. Um, what the new technology is going to allow for is an increased safety margin. You've got to realize we just barely, and I mean barely, made it to the moon. Um, Neil Armstrong himself said that his thoughts were they had a 50-50 chance of making it there and back. So the new technology is going to make it a lot more uh, safe and a lot more predictable than what we've experienced in the past. Now, uh, uh, wasn't he physically flying the, the lunar module at the end? Like there was no the, the computers were not involved at the. At yeah, uh, the the way the the lunar module was set up, it uh, it was designed to separate from the command service module and operate via computer down to a certain point. Uh, once the lunar module came in uh, over the surface of the moon, essentially the uh, the astronauts were facing up. They were flying on their backs, and then it's at a certain point the lunar module would then pitch over because you got a rocket engine and you're trying to slow down and fire that rocket engine at just the right thrust to bring you down gently on the moon. So you have to do it very, very slowly, very, very meticulous. And as soon as it pitched over and the computer, Armstrong realized the computer was taking him into a, a, a field of uh, craters and boulders, he manually took over control of it and flew out of the boulder field which made them land about two, three, maybe four miles beyond the projected landing point. That's why they were running low of fuel. Um, had, they, had they been safely, were able to safely land where they were initially supposed to land, they would have landed with a lot more fuel, a lot more reserve. But um, Did they have to do another orbit? No. Okay. No, no, no. At, at that point, um, they were down, like I said, down to within less than 20 seconds of fuel. The last minute or so of the landing, the, um, uh, the flight director, Gene Kranz, told everybody at Mission Control, the only call-outs I want to hear from now on is fuel. Uh, they didn't want to hear any other data coming back. They just wanted to know the percent of fuel that's left or, or fuel left in, in t terms of time. And then at 60 seconds, Charlie Duke, indicated just that he announced 60 seconds to let Aldrin and Armstrong know uh, and I'm sure they saw it on their indications and, and instruments that they had 60 seconds of fuel it got down to 30 seconds things got a little dicey and at that point Armstrong knew that he had to set it down quickly or they were going to really be in prob a, a problem have a problem and be in trouble how about coming back if you're down to 30 seconds how much do you need to get off the surface of the moon and get back into orbit to return. The lunar module was constructed in two stages. You had a descent stage and an ascent stage. Okay. So the ascent part of the lunar module was only used to lift off the moon. So the fuel that was indicated was only for the descent stage. Okay. So they had uh, 20 seconds or less of fuel left in the descent stage. And then the next day when they were finished their moonwalk, they were in, the, uh, in, their, in their cabin. Um, they hit the switches and so forth, and they uh, launched uh, up into lunar orbit to meet up with Mike Collins for a rendezvous and transfer back to the command and service module. So while on the surface of the moon, they were not using any fuel at all? No, no. So the, that, that descent was the only critical part? Correct. And, uh, and once they, once they uh, set down on the moon, uh, they actually vented out a lot of the remaining fuel and uh, gases and so forth in the descent stage of the lunar module because... They didn't want it to explode, so they just got rid of it. Uh, yeah. they, it was no longer needed, so they just vented everything out into uh, into space. If they had not had to take evasive action to avoid the boulder field, 
And if it landed as supposed to, how much fuel would it have remained in, in the descent space? Oh, probably a minute or more, okay. which uh, NASA at the time considered to be a, a safe margin. Mm-hmm. But if they had landed at an odd angle or broken one of the legs of the lunar module, could they couldn't have taken off, right? Correct. Because they, the ascent, yeah, it has to be a vertical ascent. Correct. There, there was a limit as far as the angle at which they could land and have the spacecraft, the lunar module, set. Um, the closest they came in the Apollo program to having a problem was on Apollo 15 when the commander, Dave Scott, set the lunar module Falcon down into uh, part of a crater. And so it had a little bit of a list to it, um, but it was still within the guidelines for a safe liftoff. And if you, if you look at the, um, the lunar liftoff of Apollo 15 uh, Falcon from the moon, you could see where it actually lifted off of the descent stage, and you could see where it actually swayed a little bit in one direction before it straightened itself out and went vertical. So they came, uh, they came pretty close to not making it on Apollo 15, but they were still within the safety margin. I have a landing question. All right. All right. So if you're headed to the moon, you can land on the moon. But if you're headed back to the Earth, why do you have to land in the ocean? Uh, at that time, um, all of our spacecraft landed in the ocean. Uh, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, we, we splashed them down. It wasn't until we got into the space shuttle program that we landed on terra firma. Um, but the, the Apollo spacecraft and any other spacecraft that we had could have safely landed on, on the Earth. Uh, we didn't have to land in water. It, um, it was just a, um, probably a little bit better safety margin. Um, it provided a little bit more comfort for the crew to hit the water at, say, 20 miles per hour than, than hitting the land. Uh, the Russians have always landed their manned spacecraft on the Earth, and the way they do it, is uh, they come in and just a few feet above the surface of the earth they fire a set of rockets to slow down the uh the the impact i also think wouldn't it also a recovery issue the ocean is big and we have the navy goes out and plucks them out exactly Uh, the navy was was uh, obviously involved in in this um back at the time apollo 11 was uh, picked up by the uss hornet um and uh, recovered. Uh, all of the uh, crew members of the Hornet that were involved in this had gone through extensive training on how to um, how to spot the pace, spacecraft, how to uh, track it, and how to safely recover it and the astronauts. Um, when the astronauts came back from the moon, they didn't know. NASA did not know if they might be bringing back uh, some some pathogens, some uh, sort of harmful bacteria, germs, whatever. So. Before the astronauts came out of the spacecraft, the frogmen of the Hornet uh, got, all, got right next to uh, the, uh, the spacecraft, and the door was open, the hatch was open, and they tossed in biological isolation garments. So all three astronauts had to essentially change clothes, take their spacesuits off, and put these, uh, these garments on that had uh, breathing apparatus and so forth. And if you look at the pictures, you see uh, they, they've got this, uh, this breathing apparatus on and uh, really strange-looking uh, suits that they're wearing. And uh, they were individually picked out uh, of the raft and taken up into a helicopter, taken back to the aircraft carrier, where they had a, a highly modified uh, uh, mobile home, if you will, a little trailer. Airstream. It, yes, it, it was an Airstream trailer that had been highly modified. And uh, they stayed in that until they got back to Houston, where they went into uh, more permanent quarters for three weeks. So they were in quarantine for 21 days. And uh, anybody that came in direct contact with them during that time uh, without having the, the isolation garments on, they themselves were also quarantined. So there were a couple of other people from the outside world that were part of the team that assisted them during their quarantine period. Yeah, Rodney, if memory serves, when John Glenn touched down uh, off Caicos Islands with the very first uh, uh, landing, uh, they did not recover the capsule. Uh, they, they did. They, they did. recovered that, okay. yes. Uh, of, of all the spacecraft that, that were out there, they got them all back in, initially, except for Gus Grissom's Liberty Bell 7. Gus Grissom did a suborbital flight in July of 1961 which was a basic uh, copy of what Alan Shepard did in uh, May, just a few months earlier. It uh, was shot up into space, went up about 115, 116 miles or so, landed uh, 
about 120 some miles downrange in the Atlantic Ocean. And when uh, Gus Grissom um, was in the capsule, uh, the hatch inadvertently blew off of the uh, off of the capsule. Uh, it immediately began filling with water. Gus was lucky to escape with his life. He almost drowned. And uh, the recovery forces were unable to keep a hold of the sinking spacecraft, and they had to let it go. Otherwise, it would have taken the helicopter down as well. And that spacecraft sat in the ocean floor up until the late 1990s when it was recovered, and it's been completely restored, and it's now on display. Yeah. Any well, idea the weight of that craft? I have no idea. It was it was far. It, it exceeded the uh, the the. the uh, the rating of what the helicopter could safely lift. Especially filled with ocean water. And, 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 and where was it, Rodney, exactly? Um, I, I'm not exactly sure of the exact landing location. It was about 120 miles off the coast of Florida. And Gus Grissom was, was the snake bit astronaut. He, that was his first. And in Gemini, there was some problem, but then he was killed in Apollo 1. He was burned up on the, on the pad. Here, well, 30, he was, 30 seconds, Rodney. Okay, yeah. Uh, Gus was picked for uh, the first uh, manned Gemini space flight back in uh, 1965. Um, he went up. There was there was very few um, problems with that that particular flight, except for John Young smuggled aboard a corned beef sandwich, <laughs> <laughs> which threw off the weight of the ship and it just messed everything up. Rodney, it's amazing you do all that without notes. Great stuff, man. You're welcome. Speaking of frogmen, I'll send you out with Clarence Frogman Henry here on the program as we get to our final minute of the show coming up next. Brought to you in part. By Larry DeMarco and Company at Century 21 Modern Realty Results and the Skinner Accident and Injury Attorneys. Skinnerwins.com. Hey.